All right. Rosie, and then tell me, McKinney, is that how we say the last name? McKinney? That is how you say it. Okay. Rosie McKinney, welcome to the Pure Desire podcast for the first time. It is my pleasure to be here. It's it's quite an honor to be invited. So thank you very much, guys. Absolutely. I uh, I've This is the first time we're meeting. Uh, Nick was telling me a little bit about, uh, was it SILS? You guys were at SILS yes. and had some conversations. The Sexual and so, Integrity Leadership Summit. Yeah. Most people have no idea if no, we don't say the you're right. You're initials right. there. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Nick was telling me about your ministry and the story and just felt like it'd be a great opportunity to have you on to talk about uh, your ministry, Fight for Love, which helps women. And I was looking through the website and all the material. Uh, you help women who have had porn invade their marriage. And I love that language, um, that idea of it's not something that's welcomed. It's something that barges in um, and for, I mean, that we don't know and we're not aware of. So uh, this is very much in the realm of what we do. And so we're really excited to, yeah, talk through it. So um, first, Rosie, why don't you just tell us a little bit about your ministry um, fight for love. Um, it was born out of your story, but could you take just a few minutes, share that with our listeners, your story, and then how this ministry was birthed? Absolutely. So my story is similar in many ways to a lot of wives story in that I have the same arc. I have the same experience. However, the timing is very different in that I actually did my experience over two relationships. So before becoming a Christian, I was in a long-term relationship with an unrepentant porn addict and I tried everything I could think of to get this out of the relationship, Um, but nothing worked. And it was the loneliest, most Mm. painful, horrible, traumatizing, shameful experience. And that that all fell apart. Um, And now I become a Christian and I meet my beautiful, shiny husband who has been a pastor Um, and has been open about his previous struggles with pornography, but he admits them. He doesn't want them. He says he's got it sorted. And I'm like, yes, I've got one of the good guys. This is not going to be a problem. Very soon into the honeymoon, I realized that "Mm -mm, this is still a problem because Mm -hmm. it doesn't just manifest, um, you know, inside the bedroom, it manifests outside in other behavioral issues. And I could see all those warning signs. And and I, I think I had sort of a PTSD trauma reaction. Like I've been here before. I know how this goes. Mm, I cannot do this again. I literally cannot, even though I'd left my country and my job and my family and made my vows in front of everybody I knew. It was like, no, I can't do this again. So I put my foot down really early and said, you need to get help or we can't move forward. Mm. And fortunately he was done. He was ready to get into help. So we were thrown from the honeymoon into recovery, um, which was pretty traumatic. But ever since then, it's been, although a bumpy road, so at the beginning, it's had an upward trajectory. So um, he then retrained later on and became a certified sexual addiction therapist. I ran groups. We wanted to go out and share with people the hope and the freedom and the transformation that we'd experienced Um, But what we were finding is that he would go and talk to guys and he's a great speaker. He's really charismatic, but he'd only have a certain amount of success. So we thought we'd try talking to parents, go around the side and, you know, we'll talk to them about their kids, but really we're talking about their marriages. Again, you know, limited success. And I said, why don't I just talk to the wives? Mm. So I went and talked to the wives and the response was phenomenal. And I was like, oh, we've hit on something here. Mm. Women are desperate or guidance. You know, they're trying all these strategies to get rid of porn, to help, to fight for the marriage, but it's just not working. So as soon as you set them on the right path and say, hey, these are the things that work, all those other things that you've been trying don't work, they go, right. And that's when things start happening. And this is where Fight for Love came from, because it's not just about what we're fighting against. Mm. It's what we're fighting for, so which good. is, um, you know, this new marriage yep. minus the pornography, not just the old marriage without mm. it. Who wants that anyway? It was pretty dysfunctional anyway. We that's want right. something new and amazing. So that's where it came from. And now, now we've, we've got a team of 12 and they're all over the country and we're just going forward and we want to create this movement so we can go and shorten the time that people have to spend in that lonely, mm. confused yep traumatic time in between discovery and recovery. So good. Yeah. 
Yeah, I appreciate your story, Rosie, and just your openness with it. And that was one of the things that you know struck me right away in our initial conversations at that conference and kind of getting to understand a little bit more of what you're working towards was just your heart for these spouses and these women in particular that are stuck in that really tough place, um, are often hearing really confusing messages, even from their churches about what they should be doing and honestly messages that aren't helping. And we'll get into some more of those in just a little bit here, but you already used this phrase and you used it with me when we were getting to know each other down in San Antonio. And I just, I thought it's a it's a paradigm that for a lot of people, I think will be eye-opening to really consider what are we talking about? And so it's what you just said that many spouses and women in particular, that they're stuck in between discovery and recovery. So w- what does that mean? And what can someone do if they realize I'm stuck in this in-between place? Yeah, it, it's the most loneliest space because you literally believe you are the only one mm. and you don't know that recovery exists. So there's just this void. You have discovered that pornography really is happening. It's not just in your imagination. Um, you know, it is a problem in your relationship, but you don't know what to do. The world is giving you one message with these confusing messages and you're trying those and they don't work. The church is giving you another message and you're trying those and those don't work. And you're like, I just feel so hopeless, so helpless. We just keep going around in this cycle. He's promising to stop and he doesn't stop. And it doesn't seem to matter what I say or what I do. And it's a desperate, desperate place. And what, what I find happens is there's two ways that people get into recovery. One is they just get pushed to a place of sort of desperation where Mm -hmm. they do this, you know, this horrible ultimatum, which nobody wants to do, but they feel like they've got no alternative. What other choice do I have? Yeah. No other choice. Or, you know, it's a God intervention and accidentally they stumble into recovery because some, they bump into somebody and it's, you know, a divine connection and somebody goes, Hey, there's a group about this. Here's a resource. Yeah, We hear many of those. Yes. But it seems more accidental than intentional. Right, and right. so we really want to, A, prevent people from getting to that point of crisis. We're all about early intervention, not crisis management. You know, you don't have to be on your knees or on the verge of a divorce to get into recovery. Yeah. And you don't have to stumble into it by accident. It's like, let's give you the information now. Let's just put it out there. Yeah. And and I do think that, well, I, I you know, we've now trialed it. You know, the ministry has been going, you know, 18 months or so. And women are flooding in and Gosh. taking action. Yeah. And it, it's funny because I, um, funny is not the right word, <laughs> but it's interesting and ironic to me that if more people, because the cult, the church culture I grew up in, there's a lot of silence around this in general um, from both spouses, from a struggling spouse and from one who is suspicious that um, the porn or sexual brokenness is somehow a part of the marriage. Um, and even when things blow up, there's still this kind of like cloaking it and let's still hide it. Let's try to like, manage the like, I don't know, roll out of this and some, and it, a lot of it is image management and a lot of it is, um, gosh, I feel like in some ways we do it to protect the church quote, like, uh, we don't want other people to know what's going on here kind of thing. And what that does is that sets up the, uh, what you're talking about women in particular, that sets them up to feel just what you were saying. I'm completely alone. I'm the only one who's stuck in this in between. And I just, I wish more and more, and I'm so glad to hear what your ministry is doing because you're giving voice to something that is an experience across the board for so many people, but the cultures that we're in don't exactly know how to handle that balance between honesty and transparency and protecting the church, protecting reputations, marriages, all of that. And it's, a, I mean, it's messy. It's not a clean process, but yeah, it's just there, uh, there is this lack of voice to it. I'm, I just, it pumps me up to hear what you guys are doing. Yeah, it, it's funny, isn't it? You can sit in church and immediately we go to these worship songs that are so happy. Mm. And it's like completely missing the point that so many people sitting there are not in a happy place. They're in a lamenting, they're in a mourning place. Mm. And, you know, every time I hear we're trying to help those poor people out there who are struggling in <laughs> sin, and I'm like, no, <laughs> we're sitting right here, you yeah. know, talk to the people. And, it, you know, we don't, you know, when we become Christians, everything doesn't evaporate. And it's like, I'm yeah. fixed. I no longer struggle. It's like, let's just get real. You know, we're far more mm-hmm. of an impressive witness to say, 
yep, we have a porn problem, but we also have a mighty savior who can fix it. Yeah. Come and find out about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, rather than trying to p- pretend that we've got it all together because we, because we haven't. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And so for those spouses or for women, discovery being that moment that they're aware there is pornography in the marriage, there's maybe other unwanted sexual behaviors, and then recovery being that they are in some kind of proactive recovery program with others dealing with the problem. And what I heard you mention when we talked was how for some women, they might be in this place, not just weeks or months, but they may be in that place for years. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I had, um, I remember one group, I had women in their twenties and women in their seventies you know, mm. had been doing this for 50 years. And wow. it's like, you don't need to do this for 50 years, yeah. you know, yeah. let's get them in recovery now because, you know, just like you guys are doing, there are, there are so many amazing ministries out there that we just need to tell people about. It's like the help is there. The hospitals are open. Totally. Let's just get the people there. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, um, and I kind of already dipped into it. I'm sorry, <laughs> a little bit with this next question, but we can hear some of these wrong or negative mes- uh, messages when we're in that in-between space. So from your perspective, from your experience with women in particular, what are those messages? And then where do they come from? Where do we hear those messages from? Great question. I think the biggest one is wrapped up in this sense that somehow we are to blame. We are responsible. We have caused this. It's some sort of lacking in our sexual intimacy that is causing him to look somewhere else. Um, so not only is that really, you know, shameful and blaming, but it also gives us the false hope that somehow we can fix this. If we just try hard enough, you know, we can fix this and it's just not true. Um, so women are, um, you know, women who believe that the way to stop your guy from acting out is to have more sex are having obligational sex. Mm. Um, and this is extremely traumatic and harmful to her and to them. It's not giving him what he want, what he really wants, what he really needs. Mm. Um, and so it, it, it just bypasses the, the understanding that what this is all about, you know, this is not about a, a lack of sex or a lack of good sex. This is, you know, as you say many, many times on your podcast, when you get into sort of the, the brain chemistry, this is a process addiction. Mm-hmm. This is not because you are lacking, you can never compete. Um, but your question of where do they come from? Where does this message come from? That that's a really good question. Um, I, I think what one place it comes from is this just disregard of the woman's sexual experience. Like it doesn't really matter to be honest, if she's doing this out of obligation, um, Mm -hmm. which is, and that it's harmful, that doesn't really matter, which kind of is not that dissimilar to pornographic ideology, that it really doesn't matter if the woman doesn't want it. It's not about her enjoyment. It's all about male entitlement. And this was, this is not God's design for sex. This is not healthy sexuality, a mutual consensual informed experience. Um, and I think, I think it really, that this message that somehow, you know, guys have this need that we have to fulfill or they're going to explode really devalues guys. Um, and mm. it, 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 it sort of says that they're incapable of understanding God's design for sex, that yeah. this is a mirror of the covenant love yeah. and that they can't quite grasp it. And I, I feel that that's really offensive to guys as well as women. It's like we're undervaluing everybody's ability to actually grasp what sex is all about Mm -hmm. because we can't do the hard job of breaking through that shame and going, hey, we've got a problem. We're broken in this respect. So I think it all goes back to your original question is like, why can't we come forward and talk about those issues? And it's all, it's all mashed up in this lack of teaching that there are no sins that separate us from the love of God. Mm -hmm. And there is no one sin that is more sinful than any, anything else that we can't talk about. So I think we've just got to preach hard on, on that and teach hard what pornography addiction is all about, how women are affected. 
like betrayal trauma is real mm-hmm. it, you know, from the neurobiological relational stance. Their brains are literally being scrambled by this persistent betrayal and mm-hmm. trauma. So not only they are, are they affected, but they're highly, highly effective as a catalyst of change. Mm-hmm. And just like we've already spoken about this, Nick, how in many, many cases it's the wife actually standing up and going, enough, actually yeah. prompts him to go, Okay, I'll do it. I'll get into recovery. I've been I've been stalling for for whatever reason. I've yep. been stalling. Okay, now she's really serious. I need to get to do this. So we are I think we're emasculating men, we're invalidating women, mm. and I think everybody just needs, you know, a good shaking and a paradigm shift and go, let's just <laughs> tackle this head yeah. on, get it out all yeah. in the open and everybody step up to the plate. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, that's that's such a great reminder that really in some of these messages we are devaluing men by treating them like these carnal beasts that have no control over their desires. And so we better all just do our best to help them meet this insatiable need. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like God, God gave us a spirit of self-discipline and of courage and of strength. And, and it, particularly if we're in Christ, there should be a belief that um, men don't need a woman to fix his sexual problems because that's such an abdication of responsibility. Yeah. And, and being a man and really being an adult in so many ways is about holding on to responsibility for mm-hmm. our choices and actions and and not putting that on other other people. So I, I think that's a great uh, observation. And uh, what I wanted to bring up is on the flip side, I think many times women do get the negative message of, well, it's, it's your job to fix this. And we hear the really sad stories of the couples that will go to their pastor and he acknowledges he's looking at pornography and the pastor looks to the wife and says, well, how much sex are you giving him? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just like, wow, what? I mean, like, let's just perpetuate the problem. More trauma. But on the flip side, I, I think we also, m- women get the message of, well, this isn't about you. And I say that out of my own story, because as I was trying to wrestle through my own struggles and why I couldn't stop and why my wife was so angry, the message I would use with her a lot was like, well, this is just like, it's a guy's problem and all guys struggle mm-hmm. and I'm I'm working on it and it's not about you because I had these problems way before we met and I'm still working on yeah. it. It's getting, so I don't know why you're so mad because it's not about you. So <laughs> on the one hand, women get the message of, well, it's all about you to fix it. But on the other hand, they can hear it's yeah. really not about you. So you, and really what that was doing, what I was doing and what I hear in the messages from other, you know, men, churches, wherever this might come from, it, it's saying you shouldn't be so emotional or you shouldn't be so angry. It's, it's really yeah. devaluing the trauma that they're feeling and the, the betrayal. Yeah. And yeah. I was really blind to that until we got into our recovery process. But I, I just wanted to bring that up that I think women may be getting kind of a double-edged sword of on mm-hmm. the one hand, it's your job to fix it. But on the other hand, you shouldn't really be that mad about it anyway, because it's <laughs> it's not really your issue. It's so <laughs> confusing. That's such a confusing message to get. And I, as you guys are talking, one thing that came to mind for me is that we do get these messages. I mean, both men and women, um, but in our conversation for this context, women, get this message from their family of origin as well. That if their family grew up in the church and heard these messages and operated in these, I mean, I I have heard stories and I know people who have been married for 50 or 60 years and they just put, kept a lid on it. Like the wife just slogged through her marriage, knowing that it was difficult and that there was this struggle. It's like, well, you just do this. You just have sex more and you just serve your husband and you just dress up nice for when he comes home and you make sure you always have makeup on it. These messages that in some ways have just become, at least from my experience, the Western culture a little bit, um, have, I think, infiltrated just the like, this is basic truth. And so I think that we, the, the language that, um, and I can't remember, it's from PSAP. We spent some time uh, in the module one of PSAP, but the idea that you're handed a script from your family. Um, and for so many women, this is the script that they're handed. This is their baseline understanding of sexuality and the way it should play out in their marriage. And so I like as a, a parent of young boys, this is something we're trying to do is we're trying to hand them a script that there is actual understanding of what health looks like. It's not just these cultural or even familial messages that we got handed down. Like, hold on a second, let's evaluate these a little bit more and figure out what's right and what's not. Yeah, you're, you're so right. And just think what that does to a, to a woman's heart. So your husband has this insatiable need that you're the only one who, who can... Uh, satisfy, but it's not really him because you know that his head is somewhere else, but yet you've got to keep doing this and it's making no difference. And, you know, Sheila Mm. Gregory, who I think you interviewed recently um, in her study, you know, mind blowing statistics that came out of that study, but she found out that if women believe that, you know, lust is a universal 
struggle for all guys, if women are really steeped in that, 79%, so eight out of 10 women only have sex because they feel they ought to. So their own desires, their own sexuality, who cares? And, you know, this is why we've got 50% of women who can literally take it or leave it. Mm. You know, it, it's absolutely devastating. And I talk to so many wives who are just like, if I never have sex again, I really don't care mm. because it's never been about them. It's never been about their beloved, the one who's supposed to cherish them, seeking their heart. It's just about using their body while thinking about other people. It's mm. absolutely devastating. Yeah. Um, and, and that's why we need so drastically to, to get this out in the open because it's not permanent. It is reversible. Mm -hmm. You can restore and rebuild and have an incredible intimate union in all aspects of your relationship. Um, but you're going to have to fight for it because you're wading through this cultural mess, this sort of maybe family of origin mess, this church mess, um, and really seek the truth because, um, you know, the enemy is stealing, killing, and destroying. Yeah. And this area seems to be a particular favorite playground of his. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So we're going to turn the corner towards really the, you know, positive oriented, like what can we do? But before we do that, just dive into one more thing here because we've been talking about it, but I'm curious to ask kind of another angle of it, because I know we have a lot of leaders that listen to this podcast and pastors. And um, so why do you think that message to women in particular persists that says, well, you could help fix your spouse if you were just more sexy, attractive, fit, you know, whatever, Feel available. Like why do you think that persists? Because I think if we were all to step back, the idea that like I can help someone else fix their problems would be almost universally rejected. Like, well, that that doesn't work. It's not my job to fix your problems. But in this area, it seems to persist. Like that's the advice we give. Why do you think that is? Why do you think we haven't exposed that for the flawed advice that it is? Great question. Great question. The thing that always puzzles me when thinking about this very question is pornography is an idol. We are worshiping a demonic idol. So there is an idol in your household. So why on earth would you encourage wives to join them, to compete with the idol? Why not do everything they can to tear it down? It, it, it makes no sense. It's almost like we, pornography has become so normalized and ubiquitous that we don't even see it for the idol that it is. And if, if, if your husband was worshiping a demonic idol in any other more obvious way, if they were doing Ouija boards or something, you, you, there'd be no way that, that, that the, the advice that's given to, wi to wives about pornography would be given. And I think we, we've just become so inured to it. It's so normalized that we don't even really recognize what it is. And, you know, for people who've not seen pornography, this is really, really dark stuff. Yeah. This is not yeah. airbrushed you know, static images from the 1970s. It's really gnarly stuff. It's getting darker and all the time. Yep. It's getting darker all the time and it will continue to get darker because of, you know, it's market driven and our brains are getting tolerant yep. to it. Um, I, th I just have like a little premonition coming, I think. I don't know if that's the right word, but stick with me. Um, I have had this kind of thought that's been lingering a little bit. And to your point you made earlier that we just assume, and we've talked about it a little bit already, we assume that men are just like, mm, sex, good, food, good, sleep, good. Like it's just basic, simple, almost like a caveman. Um, there was a pastor, I, I watched a video recently that said that um, it, across the board in any industry, um, basically like just maintaining the status quo and mediocrity um, across the board in any context, in any arena is not, uh, people just don't put up with it. But when it comes to men in the church, there is a level of mediocrity is okay. Just make sure you're don't doing these things. But if you just maintain and go just even keel, don't do anything crazy, just stay the course. And it's interesting to me because I think that that's what comes out in this question a little bit too, is to what you were saying. That's this perspective of men that's so low um, that of course it's the wife's responsibility to fix it or to somehow play the, the, the gap filler there because the man, of course, can't do it on his own. And I um, I don't know, I could preach on this for a while because like happy wife, happy life, I feel like is part of that perspective. Not that I wouldn't serve my wife or love her, but there's this, this like 
we are secondary and we're just like the hunter gatherers who don't have any intellect. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, uh, and, and yeah. I, I think, I think men have been done a big disservice by, um, by women being excluded from the conversation because from my experience, most guys get hooked into this when they're little, when they're, you mm -hmm. know, barely, barely out of being a kid. This is not something that they chose and they've been hooked into this, mm. sucked into this. And now it's like, now pull yourself out of it. Just step up to the plate and be brave. And it's like, you know, as we've already discussed, this is really dark stuff that is literally enslaving you. It is rewiring your brains mm -hmm. and you need your partner, you, you know, you, your person to be fighting with you and putting those boundaries in place when your brain's not working mm. by, you know, by standing alongside you and going, I love you so much. I'm not going to tolerate this anymore mm. until your brain comes back online. I'm going to do the thinking. And the thinking says, we're going to get help. That's what we're going to do. And, and we need to bring people together. Stop, you know, men and women fighting and saying things like, you know, what a wife doesn't know doesn't hurt her. It's like, Really? That's not helping anybody. You think it's right. helping the guy, like happy wife, happy life. She doesn't know. A, she does know. Because even if she doesn't actually literally know, she knows something's wrong yeah. on a gut level. She yep. knows something's wrong. Yep. She, she senses it. She's being traumatized. You know, there's deception going on. There's betrayal going on. Um, so it is affecting her, even if she doesn't know it. But, the, but by saying, don't tell your wife, it's like, don't tell the one person who could possibly save you. Mm. Like, no, get her on board. She's the person who is going to fight for you mm. more than anybody else. She has more invested in you kicking this than any, anything else. And get to women early enough before there's too much damage and trauma and yeah. educate them and say, look, their brains have been hijacked. He's not trying to hurt you. You know, this is just his coping mechanism. He needs you to fight with him, mm. you know, and then show yeah. them how to fight in the right way. Yeah. So, yeah, I totally agree. So how do we, I mean, we're turning that corner now. How do we help like society, churches, communities? How do we change these unhelpful, these hurtful, negative messages? Um, and then what does it look like to support and care for spouses um, dealing with their, specifically in this context, a husband's pornography addiction? So again, I think instead of talking about, you know, men's rights to sex, we have to talk about each right, if each spouse's right to consent. And, you know, sex is a, is a gift. It's not an entitlement. And just reframe that. And the church is doing a lousy job at the moment about teaching what healthy sexuality is and what real intimacy is between men and women. Because the foundation of any truly intimate relationship is honesty. And that is the one thing that is missing when a, an addiction is present because of, by its very nature, it has to be hidden because, you know, you, you know that this is going to upset them. So you're trying to hide it. So honesty is so important and that's what needs to be preached. And, you know, I, I do think people need to lead from the front and, and open up the conversation and include women. We, this isn't just for, if you struggle with this, come to the seminar. It's like, no, let's educate everybody. Let's yeah. cast the net yep. wide. Yep. Let's do this on Sunday morning. So good. Let's have people up giving their testimonies. Let's just have people standing up in t-shirts who support. They don't have to speak so that we can see that this is actually affecting everybody. And I do believe that pastors would be more willing to stand up and say, this was my story, if they felt more secure about the reaction from their congregation. Yes, but totally. there's no guarantee that you're going to get a good reaction because people expect more from their pastors. So they're in this double bind of, we want to be transparent, but people aren't going to, you know, they're going to judge me. Um, so I think, you know, just like you, you guys do all the time about, you know, breaking the shame in the community, it's really important. But I, but I think the added piece is, let's get the women. Mm. you know, talk to the people whose brains are still working. You know, it's all very well talking to guys and yeah. going, who's struggling? I'm struggling. Now come forward. They're like, no, I'm going home to watch pornography. I can't help it. You know, let's talk to the women who go, yes, we're struggling. And then they actually, you know, do sign up because their brains are still working. Mm. Um, and, and I, I, you know, maybe I'm simplistic or, or, or naive or just eternally optimistic, but I do believe that women are the secret weapon sitting mm. silently there in the pews mm. um, because they want to save their families. They want to break this general generational curse for the next generation mm. so passionately. Yeah. You know, and even if they don't have the 
the courage to do the hard thing of setting those boundaries with their spouse, you start to talk to them about how this is impacting their children. And they're like, right, a mama bear comes out and it's like, okay, we're going to tackle this and we are going to change our entire family unit. And then this is going to be our wider family and our friends and our community. Um, and, And just from what I'm hearing from, you know, the women that I work with, our movement is growing daily. Um, women who you think would be sitting there going, well, I'm not telling anybody about my story. They're like, no, I'm going to tell you about my story because I don't want anybody else to suffer the way that I suffered for all those years. Mm. Yeah. That's such a powerful observation when you think even from kind of a brain science side, for someone who's dealing with sexual brokenness or sexual addiction, they are stuck in a level of of denial, rationalization, minimization. And that's not because they're a bad person that's just trying to ignore their Mm. problems. It's because that's how our brain has learned to function with this huge break in our morality where we're doing things we don't want to do. We know it would be hurtful and we can't seem to stop. And so we're in and we describe it in a lot of our materials as like that fog of addiction, that there's there's literal truth to that of Mm -hmm. not being able to think clearly or straight about what we need to do to extricate ourselves from the situation. And that's not an excuse in any sense, but it does speak to what you're going after here, Rosie, that that those are the people probably least equipped to reach out for help because they're stuck in it. And they're saying, oh, I'm, I'm doing okay. Yeah. When clearly they're not. Yeah. But the spouse on the other side who is living in maybe the fear or the pain or the trauma, like their brain is engaged in a way of like, what can we do? It's it's scanning the horizon. Where is their help? Like we're, we're looking for the lifeboat that's mm-hmm. gonna come and rescue us. And if you will appeal to them with the brain that's looking for that, there could be a lot of success there. And in fact, that's totally. something we're seeing more and more at Pure Desire, that when people call for counseling appointments and to start that yeah. process, more often than not, it's the it's the spouse, it's the wife who's feeling the betrayal, the pain, the trauma. And many times when it is the addict or the struggler calling, it's because he's got the, the wife in the background <laughs> who's saying, you call them or else. <laughs> and so right. then they're finally calling as you yeah. brought up. Uh, Rosie, that it's when we're in our crisis, but yeah. uh, just uh, something for all of us to keep in mind, like the the brain of the female who's being betrayed is engaged and looking for help. And so let's offer it yep. and let's get them started. And if they are equipped with some tools, it, it's not meant to me empowerment of like, okay, now go leave that schmuck behind because you're empowered. It's more like, no, here's, here's the steps you can take yep. to actually begin to potentially make a difference in your relationship that isn't just about more sex or how you dress, it's actually right. the right kind of steps. And so let's go into that, Rosie, the, the spouse that is you know, starting to get help. They're, they're moving into recovery and maybe they, um, they, they're getting into a group, they're finding community, but their acting out spouse is not, they're not pursuing help. What guidance do you offer? And I, this is out of your story too, where you tried that in a marriage that didn't work out. So what can the spouse do as she's finding recovery and help? What does she do in the relationship with the husband who's not yet there? Yeah, it is a case of you've got to grab that oxygen mask and put it on your own face first. You can't even begin to help a partner who is unrepentant, unwilling Mm -hmm. to even acknowledge it's an issue. Yeah. Um, until you put your own oxygen mask on. And it is a process of just clearing the fog because if if the addiction is continuing, there is continuing trauma. There is continuing deception and betrayal and possibly gaslighting and being manipulated and coerced or ignored. Mm. So you are it's ongoing trauma. And so at that point it becomes a, a, a survival um instinct really. And that the wife has got to try and get herself as, as healthy as possible. If she's, you know, if she's laid out the the recovery said, look, here's the help, here's the resources. People say it works. They're available. Um, and he says, no, I'm not willing to do it. She's like, okay, but there's still a hole in the boat. I'm still sitting in the boat. I'm going to go and I'm going to go and fix, you know, I'm going to go and sort myself out. And and nothing changes if nothing changes. And by her doing that, by her clearing the fog and realizing what her reality is, is going to impact him one way or another. Yeah, He might see her getting healthier and stronger and feel that he might lose her and that might um, prompt him to actually yeah. you know, get up into recovery. Or 
he might kick and scream, at which point she's now got enough stability to realize what her situation is and what her reality is. And then she's got some tough decisions to make. Yep. Um, and, you know, no, no one can make that decision for her. It's got to be something that, you know, comes from her, but you can help her get healthy, get strong and be able to see clearly what is going on. And also how life could be different because once right. you start to glimpse a bit of health, you know, oh, I've laughed today. You know, oh, yeah. I felt happy today. Yeah. You know, you want more of that. Um, so yeah, it's a really, it's a, I've been there, you know, and, yeah. and sometimes, you know, it, it, it doesn't work out. And we have many women in our, in our team, in our group that um, it didn't work out, but that's not to say that the women haven't had a happy ending because now yeah. they have discovered new life, new yeah. purpose, new joy. Um, and some of the husbands have, you know, they've hit rock, bock, rock, rock bottom because their, you know, spouse has left and they've got into recovery and some of them haven't. Yeah. So there is nothing to be lost by pursuing your own recovery as hard as you possibly can and everything yeah. to gain. Um, and we say this about, you know, recovery on the side for those that struggle with sexual brokenness, that once you have gained some traction and have health um, and understand what that looks like to live that out, it's not like life or your context gets easier. Like you have tools now, you know, I think of a betrayed spouse is in this situation. You get a voice and you start to get health and some understanding of what's going on. You put language to your experience, um, that decision, and we'll get to that difficult decision that a lot of women find themselves having to make, but it doesn't mean that those, those decisions are made for you. It means that you've now developed a voice and have clarity on a direction um, where before, you know, like it feels like the betrayed spouse is caught up in the fog too, like the fog of, you know, of this addicted spouse. So it's not like it's going to become simpler or even easier per se, but you will have clarity. And I feel like can have more conviction behind decisions that you make when if you're in a fog, it's hard to know which direction do I go here? Yeah. And women who have walked away can walk away with the assurance that they have literally tried everything. Mm. Because those women who have just tried competing or ignoring or yeah. prematurely forgiving, they haven't tried the thing that works, yeah. which is setting boundaries. You know, and, and that breaks my heart when I hear stories who've, whose marriages have fallen apart and they never did that bit. They never knew that that was what they had to do. They had to stand up and, yeah. and draw that boundary and say, you know, we need to get into recovery. They just exhausted themselves and traumatized themselves and literally their hearts just broke trying so hard to fix it. And it all fell apart. And it's like, oh, I wish, I wish that you had known what, what does work. So at least you've tried that. Yep. Rosie, talk a little bit more about the word you just use, boundaries. Because I think for a lot of spouses, that's odd to think about because maybe the only boundary they've considered is either change or I'm out of here. Yep. And that could be a boundary, but I'm guessing you would say that's just a boundary. There's a lot of other ways we could create appropriate boundaries if our spouse isn't changing. So talk a little bit about, about that word boundaries. Well, I mean, boundaries are everything, aren't they? Boundaries are... Uh, are my superpower now that I never had before. Um, <laughs> but ideally, if you can start to do some boundary work in your relationship, as soon as you start to sniff that pornography is an issue in your relationship, those boundaries are going to be so, they're going to be so less painful to implement because it's going to be, um, okay, we obviously have an issue with pornography. Okay. You're the one doing it, but it, we've still got the issue. Yeah. And I, I want us to get help mm. and I'd like you to be part of that. But if you're not willing to do that or you can't do that, I'm going to do that. So you're, you're setting a very clear boundary. I am going in this direction. I would love you to be on board with me, but I am going in that, I am going in that direction towards health. Um, that could be an example of a boundary. It doesn't have to be, you know, do this or I'm going to leave you. It's just right. making sure it's very clear that uh, your dysfunction and your, you know, enslavement is not going to determine the trajectory of my mental health and, yeah, and future yeah. anymore. So good. Yeah. Taking ownership of my own, like as a betrayed spouse, taking ownership of my own direction in that and not um, tethering that to someone's addiction for sure. 
Um, okay, so I am really interested in this, in your response to this question, because we have, and you've talked about it already a little bit, that people get to the point of separation, divorce, question mark, what do I do? Um, so when they're considering that, um, how do you help a person in that situation? <laughs> this is such a hard question, the more I think about it. How do you help someone discern the idea of sticking it out, persevering, like doing the difficult work over a longer period of time to fight for the marriage? And then the other option of separation or divorce. How do you help someone who's caught in that, uh, man, it feels like just should a Should I stay or should I go? <laughs> yeah, to put simply. Well, to be perfectly frank with you, we don't do that bit because we are the ambulance and you mm -hmm. guys are the hospital. So you wouldn't ask the ambulance driver to do, you know, to determine whether or not to lop your leg off. Um, <laughs> you know, they are the ones just getting you to the hospital. That's a great analogy. So, yeah, it's super good. So um, we, are, we are facilitating them into recovery mm. and you need someone who knows your circumstances. You know, you need someone to walk alongside you because there is such a spectrum of experiences here from wives. We've got, you know, guys who, uh, women who are married to absolute sweethearts who are incredibly repentant and, you know, want really, really, really want to kick this. And, you know, it's just, they're always in tears and, you know, both yeah. of them are in tears and it's a very, very sweet, but painful situation. And then you've got, you know, on the other end, other end, we've got wives whose husbands are drugging and raping them repeatedly. Wow. So there is a massive yeah. spectrum. Yeah. So what you need is to, um, uh, find people to really help you work out what your reality is. But saying that as the ambulance drivers, we do take them to different clinics. So if I've got people on different ends of the spectrum, I'm going to point them towards different ministries. Sure. So if I've got someone in a very um, abusive relationship and the guy seems pretty um, unrepentant and, you know, she is really, really suffering and I'm worried about her safety, I'm going to point her towards an organization that, that, has expertise in you know, domestic violence, emotional abuse, yeah, all that yep, stuff. Totally. Um, and that's part of our job as well to sort of just help put them in the right clinic. And then those people are the ones actually going to help them mm. make those decisions, whether they're going to stay or go. But I'm, but that in almost every situation, there's always an option C, mm -hmm. you know, it might not be like I have to divorce or I'm going to stay with them forever. It's like, well, maybe you just need a holiday for a couple of weeks. Yeah. You know, if you look carefully, there's normally an option C. Mm. So you don't have to make a decision that you're not ready to make. And so that two week holiday might just give you a bit more clarity, yeah. a bit more experience of life without the craziness yeah. to help you make an informed decision. Yeah. yeah such yeah. great wisdom there, Rosie, that, mm -hmm. that these are major life decisions and we, we have very unique stories, unique situations, and we need people alongside of us that know the ins and outs of our stories that are really advising what's best because situation to, to situation, it may differ yeah. based on our particular marriage and background and everything going on. And, um, and we, we, we do want to recognize the value of what, you know, what we'd call like a therapeutic separation that is an intentional space in order for progress to be made and to see if the marriage mm -hmm. can work. And so for, for people to hear, like, there's, there's almost always an option three or, or, or C that you could consider. Yep. And if, if someone that cares about you knows your story well, can be a part of that decision-making process, mm -hmm. it's more likely you're going to arrive at the one that is, that is really right and best for you. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So Rosie, speak to the other side of this, because for this podcast, we do have a lot of listeners who are men in recovery. And thankfully, in many of those stories, their spouse is also in a recovery group or maybe listening to the podcast with them. Um, and then we, we do have men in recovery whose wives have not engaged or, you know, it's your problem. I don't want to deal with it. Uh, but their, their heart is to restore the marriage, to rebuild trust, rebuild intimacy. So what would you say to that husband, or, you know, it could be a wife who's rebuilding trust, but you know, let's be honest right now, it's more often than not a husband. Uh, they've been the struggler, they've been the addict, they're pursuing healing, they're pursuing recovery. What are the best things they can be doing to support their betrayed spouse and show their genuine desire to change and rebuild the relationship? Oh, that's my favorite question ever. <laughs> How can guys help? Um, just before I start, um, if you've got a, a wife who is really resistant to getting into, into recovery, I would just um, send her a link to our podcast because that's our whole job 
getting people from discovery into recovery. Mm, so nice. maybe we can help you out there because a we try and make recovery. For you. There you go. Yeah, we awesome. just we try and make it as enticing as possible, and you can listen to all us chatting, and you 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 sm- you can hear what recovery sounds like. And it's like, well, they sound like a fun group of women. Can't be all that bad. (laughs) Um, That's, you know, one of our big goals to sort of like just normalize it and make that first initial step just a little bit less scary. So A, we're a resource. Um, But if your wife um, is finding support, a big thing you can do is just be patient. Mm -hmm. Just be patient. I know you've done your disclosure and you're feeling very proud of yourself. And, you know, Mm -hmm. what's her problem? Why, you know, she knows everything now. Why is she not trusting me? It's like, okay, it's going to take a really long time. Yeah. Her entire world has been upended. And Jake Porter has this amazing analogy of a filing cabinet of all your memories that has literally just been dumped out on the floor and scrambled. Mm. And that's her reality. She is desperately trying to make sense of what has gone on in the past. Like, hang on a minute. So those three years ago when we were there, you were doing what? And her brain is constantly searching for safety. Mm. So I know it might be frustrating that she's asking you the question for the 17th time and she really should be over this by now. She can't help it. Right. So just to give you that reassurance that it's perfectly normal, it's part of the process. She's not going to be there forever. Just be patient. Just hang in there. Um, Do the work you know, show up as the husband you want to be. Don't get stuck in the, Mm. you know, the, what what they call it, the bad box. Don't get stuck in there forever. You know, like I'm never going to make this up. I'm, I'm an awful person. Right. It's like show up as the husband you want to be Mm. someone who is going to be empathizing with her and validating her and just telling her that, yes, that was the reality. And that was awful. But by you showing up and being able to be with her in her pain is showing her that you have changed and that you're not the guy who hid it all from her. And that goes such a long way. You're not going to be able to undo what you did, but you can build something so much yeah. better mm. by, by being this and you know engage in and another one of Jake's phrases is the cloud of struggle. It's going to be difficult. you know. Lean in to validating her pain. Lean into those moments where you really want to run away. You know, dial up the the the, the, uh, the, the conversation that's getting awkward. You know, lean into it mm-hmm. um, because that is the way through it and out of it. And that's what's going to enable her to finally come out of her shell and trust her and uh, trust you again. Um, is is not because you've erased what's happened, but because you're showing her that you are a new husband. Mm, yeah, so good. So good. I've, I've told guys in group that your disclosure or you know the, those moments of discovery was like an, uh, someone just took a bomb to your house of bricks and now there are bricks just littering the whole yeah. you know, yard and they're everywhere. And recovery is like you going out and picking up a brick and bringing it back to the house and putting it on the foundation. Like that's when you go to group. And then you know you go get another mm-hmm. brick and put it into the foundation, and it's like that's where you were patient with her and understanding yeah. of some pain, and, and it's just like brick by brick, and, and yeah, it feels slow, yeah, and totally. it's it's long suffering, but you are piece by piece rebuilding the house that mm-hmm. in a moment okay. uh, of discovery or disclosure felt like it was destroyed. Yeah, it, it yeah. takes that process, and and sometimes you don't even realize when you've put a brick back in, but sometimes it is something as simple as noticing that she didn't have a lunch made and you help out and make it or, mm-hmm. or you're aware of her needs and it's like, oh, oh, he never did that before. And you might even not even have thought of it. Oh, I'll do this because it'll show her that I've changed. You're just, you're making it your intent to be less about yeah. yourself and more about her. And that's putting another brick into the house. And yeah. over time, the house is rebuilt, but mm-hmm. it, it, it's, it can feel like a very slow process. So your words, Rosie, of patience is very, very well needed. Thank you. And, and I would say, because I, I do like that analogy of the bricks, the best way that you can make progress is when she goes and kicks over the wall that you've just put together because she is really angry still. And she is dealing with an awful lot is you just say, I go, I totally understand why you did that. And you put the bricks back. Mm. Don't go, see, it's never going to get better. I mean, it's going going to trigger you just like whatever has triggered because great point. Yeah. Because you, you know, making lunch for her, it's like, seriously, I don't care. You know, you know, you've just, I don't know, slept with 300 prostitutes. I've just found this out and now you're making lunch for me. I don't care. Yeah, and exactly. It, 
you, you, you're just going to have to put those bricks back a lot of time and she's going to be kicking them over for a while. And yeah. that's okay. Yeah. Because if you just keep picking them up, eventually mm. that's, that's how you show up as the guy that she always wanted. That's, that's all she ever wanted was just a guy who's going to pick the bricks back and allow her to be human. Right. You know, because so this good. is for the first time now her heart's coming out and it's like, I've got years of pain yep. that's ready to come out now. And right. you're just going to have to take it. I'm afraid. And just put the, you know, not that she can abuse you. And I think that's part of her healing that she has to show up for you in a way that's helpful, mm -hmm. but acknowledging that you're both struggling and both triggering yeah. each other. Um, but as the one who did the betraying, it is your responsibility to pick the bricks up. Right. And yeah. eventually she'll stop kicking them over. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Um, okay. So, um, Rosie, we've talked a little bit about your ministry. Um, and I, I'm hearing really an answer to the question we had wrote, like why you started it. I would definitely hear that throughout. Um, but like what led to that name? I mean, talk about that a little bit more and you kind of, you mentioned it toward the beginning, but I want to circle back to it again. Um, what is the, the, the emphasis for fight for love? Talk about that. It's because this whole journey is a really strange gift, one that nobody ever wants, but actually it could be the worst, best thing that ever happened to you mm -hmm. and your marriage, because by going down this rabbit hole and entering the cloud of struggle, you are going to develop the skills that, you, that normally take decades, if you ever get there, how to actually be truly authentic and vulnerable and intimate with one another. And that is an amazing marriage. That is how we were designed to be naked with one another in every respect. That mm. is the, how God designed marriage. I mean, it's a beautiful thing, but you can just see how Satan came in and just messed it up. And so the whole goal is to get back to that. And that's what we're fighting for. You know, what does Julie Slattery call it? Gospel centered sexuality. That's what we're fighting for. It's not just, you know, we're fighting against the pornography angrily. It's like, no, we are striving towards um, building something really beautiful. And in order to get there, we've yeah. got to tear down this dirty gray Asherah pole of pornography that's in the way at the moment. And that's just, that's just part of it. It's not really about that. It's about, you know, getting to the underlying intimacy mm -hmm. disorder and creating something new. That's so, it's just so good. I mean, it's what we talk about all the time, that recovery principle of it's not just what you're avoiding and saying no to, but it's what you're working toward and walking toward and pursuing. That's also just as important. Yeah. 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 Uh, Rosie, we are so thankful for your voice in this area. Um, a needed voice. Literally and your accent <laughs> and <laughs> also your voice. voice in the space. Totally. It, it's just one we need more of and in the church and in our culture that yeah. that is, um, I think championing the needs and the the journey of the betrayed spouse, but in a way that is to say the go the end goal is healthier marriages, mm -hmm. not just self empowered women that are off doing their own thing. Because I unfortunately in our culture there's kind of that women's empowerment movement that kind of leaves marriages in the dust. And and you're the the opposite of that. It's it's empowering women to have their voice so that yes. they can be in God honoring marriages, hopefully in the one they're in. Uh, but we know that's not always the case. That sometimes um, God will lead people to make those really hard decisions. And so we're, we're praying for those that listen that are in these tough places where one or both of you are in between recovery and discovery. Uh, and I think Rosie and her ministry has so much to offer you as our listener. Yes. So Rosie, you mentioned your podcast, just what are other ways that people could be in touch with you, could be in touch with Fight for Love, could follow what you've done, just um, clue our listeners in how they could continue to engage with your ministry. Okay, so um, our website is fightforloveministries.org. And um, I have a book, which is sort of a, a biblical battle plan, or in other words, a uh, idiot's guide to porn addiction um, <laughs> for wives. Um, that's called Fight for Love. The podcast is called Fight for Love. And then we have a growing Facebook group, a private group mm. um, for women, um, and it called Fight for Love Fellowship. And you can just come and look, you can just come and you know, hear the questions, hang out, get support. Um, it's like a really easy baby step. You know, yeah, the podcast totally. I think is probably the, the easiest baby step. Yeah. You can just listen to that in the privacy of your own home. And then maybe you want to join the group and then you come to us and we will, you know, pop you on the life raft and show you where all the other fabulous resources are mm. like Pure Desire. And I just had, I was just interviewed Ashley and she's going to be on our podcast. Fantastic. Great. 
So um, that was a really cool interview. So very, very excited about what you guys are doing because there'd be no point in me doing what I did if there was nowhere to take people. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we appreciate thanks, that. Rosie. Yeah. That's cool. I, it just, it becomes so clear, like obviously sexual addiction and brokenness are entering relationships. And when it does, it's so damaging. Um, but Rosie, the biggest thing I'm taking away is that, I, that, that truth that we should be involving both spouses in uh, really what we're doing is we're fighting for marriages, as we've already talked about a number of times that this restoration process is not so just one person and one person can get healthy, but that this marriage, these two people together can get healthy. So Thank you, number one, for being with us today. It was so great with you. And then also thank you for what you guys are doing with your ministry. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to, to spend time with you today. Thank you so much. Yeah. And wherever you're at on your journey, Pure Desire is here to help create a roadmap for your healing. If you or someone you know is impacted by sexual brokenness or betrayal trauma, go to puredesire.org and let's start the healing journey today. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. Each week we put out new content to help you on the road to freedom from the effects of sexual brokenness and betrayal trauma. And lastly, never stop being healthy. 